Good morning, George. How's the baby? Very well this morning. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Only one cat this morning? <laughs> this was not our cat night. But this little fellow is nearly frozen stiff, so. <laughs> Thank you. are dangerous you could get mugged oh well now someone got mugged at high noon on the steps of st patrick's it could happen anywhere anytime do you really need another cat <laughs> no but it needs me i'll see you later andrew maitland maitland can't you convince my mother to stay home at night i doubt it if you'll forgive me sir oh. You're home. Oh, you don't have to worry about anything now. No. Anything to worry about. None at all. There, cat. Make yourself comfortable. See, you've got company. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Maria's preparing your breakfast tray, madam. May I suggest you have it in bed? Why? I'm not sick. It was a long night, madam. And I thought you might be tired. Well, if I'm tired, it's from those long, endless arguments with my son. You know, I can't remember the last time I heard him laugh, or even smile, for that matter. <clears throat> well. about the new complex. I think it's a viable project, especially since we can acquire the land for under five million. There's also the cost of tearing down the existing tenements. Negligible when you consider the overall picture. It's uh, going to call for an investment of about uh, 40 million dollars, uh, depending on interest rates, of course. And the rates are decidedly in our favor right now. The question is, will Mrs. Kingsley go along? With her 51%, she can outvote us, as she did with the government contract. My mother is inclined to be biased about armaments, but this is quite another thing, and I'm sure I can get her to agree. No, absolutely not. The decaying, rat-infested tenements. I think you'd be happy to see them torn down. I would be, if the people who lived in those tenements had a better place to go that they could afford, but they don't. You can't change the world, Mother. Oh, that's such a poor excuse for doing nothing. Now, you know how much I admired Father. Yes. And I know how much he would have approved of this project. Oh, no, no, he would not have. Well, unless he could have provided a decent, low-cost housing for those people who are going to be displaced. No, I'm sorry. I just can't throw people out onto the street. There are too many homeless out there already. Winos and bums. Oh. Good night, Andrew. Good night, Mother. Maitland! Yes? Madam. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I should be taking my bad temper out on you. Oh, no, that's quite all right, madam. Is there something you wished for? Um, uh, yes. Uh, it's supposed to snow tonight, and I think we ought to start out early. Is the cart ready? Yes, madam. Good. And where are your galoshes? You know I dislike wearing overshoes, madam. Wear them. Beats getting the flu.
going to go to sleep now. That's the way you put it. Okay. A little kiss in the air. Okay. Okay, kiddo. Now, you go back to sleep. Only don't make no mess. Maria, I still can't decide where to get Maitland for Christmas. Do you have any ideas? Sure. Buy him an airplane ticket to Puerto Rico. So this way, my mother can teach him how to cook. <laughs> He's a wonderful cook. You're just not used to American food yet, that's all. A pie with kidneys in it is American? Well, ugh. Hamburgers is American. Pizza is American. You know, my mother, she knows how to cook American. And she don't even have a stove. You miss your mother, don't you? She is my mother. Of course. It was a foolish question. I'm sorry. Why, you miss your grandkids too, huh? Hmm. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I weep for them. But why they go so far away and they don't come back? Uh, they don't get along with their father. Why, well, you can't fix it? I'm afraid it's long past fixing and it's a shame it's a crying shame sorry to trouble you mr kingsley but uh i've just met with the auditors they're pretty upset i'm not interested in their emotional problems it's about your mother what's she done now <laughs> she doesn't write checks she doesn't get receipts she just hands out cash the IRS won't accept a tax deduction for charity without proof. I think Mrs. Kingsley's conduct's gone beyond the point of eccentricity. Are you saying that my mother is unbalanced? No. No, no, of course not. I... I think Mrs. Kingsley's a remarkable woman. I just thought you should be apprised of the situation with the IRS. I'll speak to my mother. That'll be all, Groton. Franklin, will you call my mother and tell her I'd like to join her for dinner this evening? Then come in and bring your book. Don't you like your salmon? Fine. Then why aren't you eating? Mother... Uh... Andrew, let's have it. Have what? The reason you wanted to have dinner with me tonight. Why do I have to have a reason? It's Monday. I know it's Monday. Well, ever since Marion died, you come to dinner every Wednesday. Now, you never deviate from your schedule come hell or high water. So, I assume you have a reason for coming tonight. And it's probably an unpleasant one. Why does it have to be unpleasant? Because every time you have something unpleasant to tell me, you do it. Where it won't matter if I make a scene. Why are you always so suspicious of me? 
I'm not suspicious. It's just that I know you so well. And Andrew, if it's about that new complex, forget it. I'm not going to change my mind. It's not the complex. Good. Then what? Your personal account. What about my personal account? You hand out cash. Mm-hmm. Well, is there a law against that? No, of course not. But if we're going to claim a tax deduction for the money you give to charity, the IRS demands proof. Now, if you wrote checks or got receipts... Huh? <laughs> How can someone, without any identification, cash a check? I don't see what good a receipt would do from someone whose only address is a subway grate or maybe a cardboard carton. Then why do anything? You know, the Amos Kingsley Foundation donates millions to charity. Mm-hmm, and it's all tax deductible. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing really, but maybe, maybe if you paid a little more taxes and weren't always looking for loopholes, then the government might, just might, stop cutting the budget for the needy. That doesn't make sense. Well, it does to me. But then, of course, I didn't graduate from Harvard Business School. Why can't you just accept the fact that I'm trying to protect you? Me or my money? There is a difference, you know. charges against you later. Good. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, if they don't go, I don't go. Bail them out. television and all the papers to make such a spectacle of yourself. Really, Andrew, I am in no mood for a lecture, so just sit on it, please. Good 
There's the station. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's dying. Maitland? What happened? Madam collapsed in the park. She was still unconscious when the ambulance arrived. He called Dr. Greenspan. He's with her now. How is she, Henry? I'm fine, Andrew. Fine, see? There hasn't been time for more than a cursory examination. Her pressure is elevated, but nothing threatening. There, you see? I'm fine. Nevertheless, I want her to stay in hospital for some tests, but she refuses. There is absolutely no reason to make tests. I'm fine. You probably are, but we won't know until we take the tests. Maybe you can talk some sense into her. Dr. Murphy to pediatrics. Dr. Murphy Andrew, to pediatrics. ask the nurse to bring my clothes. I'm going home. You're not going home. You're going to stay and do whatever tests Henry thinks are necessary. Look, I am all right. I promise. People don't collapse unless there's a reason. Well, that's a jolly thought, I must say. It's just a precaution. Well, look, I, for once, just once, won't you do what I ask? Especially when it's for your own good. You really are worried, aren't you? Of course I'm worried. Oh. Uh, yes. Yes, I'll stay. Uh, I frankly don't think there's any need for it, but if it's going to make you feel any better, all right. Hey, she's gonna be okay? Madam appears to be in her usual spirits. But she will remain in hospital for a few days for some tests. Hey, you don't look so hot. I bet you don't eat all day. How about I scramble you up some eggs? Thank you, no. I've no desire to eat. Hey, she's gonna be okay. an enlargement of the wall of an artery, like a bubble. And in this instance, it's inoperable. I'm very sorry, Amanda. Uh, uh, what you mean is I... I have a bubble in my head. And it's going to burst? That's one way of putting it. I'm so sorry. When? There's no way of knowing. Oh. B but it can happen any time? Yes. Soon? Soon is relative. Weeks. Months. But it's, uh, inevitable. I'm so sorry, Amanda. <laughs> You dear sweet Henry, please stop saying you're sorry. I never thought I was immortal. <laughs> I'll tell Andrew. No. Oh, no. No, I, I... I don't want Andrew to know. He's your son, Amanda. I know. I know that, but... There's no point in upsetting him over something that... nothing can be done about. And... there's another reason, too. Uh, I don't want uh, what time I have left to be spent being treated like an invalid. There are too many things that I have to do. What about pain? Minimal. Oh, thank heavens. That's a blessing. Because you know what a chicken I am about pain. Yes, I know. <laughs> um... Will I be incapacitated before it happens? It's unlikely, but... Good. Then I want your absolute solemn word of promise that you will not tell Andrew. I think you're wrong. But I'll respect your wishes, of course. 
Oh, cheer up. This is one secret you won't have to keep very long. That's a hell of a thing to say to a doctor. Well, I didn't say it to my doctor. I'm saying that to my friend. But I'm going to tell Maitland. Why Maitland and not Andrew? Because Maitland will probably be with me when it happens, and I want him to be prepared. You understand? Thank you, Henry. And, uh, that's it. Uh, well, everyone dies. <laughs> it's just a matter of when and how. Yes, madam. Is there anything else? No. No, you know everything that I know right now. Thank you for confiding in me. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, that would be nice, yes. Maitland. I knew you would handle this well. Thank you. Sure, you know how to get to Brooklyn? Yes, I consulted the map. Good. But how come you picked me? Did somebody recommend me? Uh, no, I uh, I took your name out of the yellow pages. Oh. But why bother coming all the way to Brooklyn? I mean, there are plenty of private investigators in Manhattan. I'm talking about big time operators. Yes, I know. But you see, my husband opened his first little office about three doors from here. And it was the beginning of a very successful business. And since our good fortune started on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, I felt that I would be lucky here as well. I guess that's as good a reason as any. Okay. What have you got for me to go on, please? Mason, please. Thank you. Here you are. Thank 
you. Oh. No, I just thought that they were little kids, that this was some kind of custody hassle. Oh, no, heavens no. And, of course, they're much older now than they were in those pictures. Uh, Josh, he's 22. I'm 24, madam. That would make Melissa 26. Melissa is 26, madam. And Harley is 32. 32? Oh, it's hard to believe he's been gone so long. Huh. Uh, excuse me, would you help me out here and tell me something specific about them, please, okay? Oh, yes, well, uh, Melissa. All right. Always wanted to be an actress, even as a child. She certainly has the good looks for it. And this one is? That's Josh. He has a lovely voice, and he's especially fond of country music. But that is, he was. Uh, and this one must be, how do you pronounce it, Harley? Yes, that's Harley. What can I tell you about Harley? Except that he was always involved with causes. What do you mean, what, what kind of causes? Well, uh, Vietnam. He demonstrated against it. And then he finally left the country to avoid being drafted. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you this. Uh, are they in any kind of trouble? Oh, no. No. No, uh, my grandchildren left home because they were at odds with their father. And uh, they didn't want me to have to lie about where they were if he tried to find them. They wanted to spare me. And I wanted them to have their freedom to make their own good lives in their own ways. All right, I'm going to be very honest with you. If they don't want to be found, and from what you're telling me, they don't want to be found. This is a real long shot, you know. Oh, yes, I realize that. But, Mr. Hoffner, something has come up that makes it very important to me that you do find them. And there's not much time. Uh, let me see now. There's five, ten thousand dollars, uh, plus all of your expenses, and an extra five thousand for each grandchild you find by Christmas. Well, if it's not enough, I have more. No, no it's, it's it's enough. Oh, good. Then you'll take the case. I'll tell you, I'd be crazy not to. <laughs> then it's settled. Uh, where will you begin? Uh, I'm going to try Nashville. Oh, and why Nashville? That's where most country singers try to break in. Like you said, you were lucky here. I just might get lucky there. <laughs> that is very good thinking, Mr. Huffner. You know, the moment I saw your address in the directory, I knew you were the right man for the job. You haven't said one word since we left Mr. Huffman. Would you like to tell me what's bothering you? Nothing is bothering me. Oh, <laughs> come now. After 40 years, you don't think I know when you're disturbed about something? I'm not disturbed, madam. Would you like a glass of sherry before dinner, madam? No, thank you. I want to talk to you, Maitland. Sit down. I should see to the dinner, madam. The dinner can wait. Sit down, please. You disapprove of my hiring Mr. Hoffner, don't you? Quite the contrary. I very much approve, madam. Then what is it? Since you insist, madam, I'm disturbed that you were less than forthcoming with Mr. Hoffner. You, uh, you 
think I should have told him why I wanted to find my grandchildren? Yes, madam. I couldn't do that. Well, I don't want the children to come home just because I might drop dead any moment. No, I want them to come because they're ready to put the past behind them and to make peace with their father. And I don't want Andy to be alone and alienated from his children. After I'm gone, Forgive me, madam. I should have known. It's all right. I could use that sherry now. Sound Studio, all right? Change that station, will you please? Okay, next. Lady, all I want to do is deliver a message to him. Josh's grandma hired you to find him and ask him to come home for Christmas. This is... Well, you don't believe me? I'll be very happy to give you her phone number. You can check it out for yourself. No, I guess you're on the level. Okay, thank you. Josh is always talking about his grandma. He was crazy about her. Well, does this mean you're going to tell me how I can get in touch with him, please? Well, Josh has been running from bad feelings and bad memories for a long time. Maybe if he went home for Christmas and faced his daddy, he'd get it out of his system. Okay. Okay what? Josh is on his way to San Antonio. Thank you. He got a job there. Do you mind telling me the name of the place where he'll be working? It's a place called the Lopin Lariat. Excuse me, the Loping Lariat? You won't have no trouble finding it. I don't think so, no. You don't have to rush either. That thing he's driving, it'll take him a couple days to get there. Thank you. Loping Lariat. Mr. Hupner, that is marvelous news. Yes, and I have no doubt you're going to find those other two scallywags as well. And thank you. Thank you so much for calling. Yes, goodbye. Well, he found Josh. He hasn't spoken to him yet. But he will in the next few days. That's very good news indeed, ma'am. Oh, indeed it is. Uh, did you order the tree? It's much too early for the tree, madam. No, I don't think so. I want to be absolutely sure that we get the biggest and most beautiful tree available. My grandchildren are coming home for Christmas. It doesn't leave a great deal of time for Mr. Huffner to find Harley and Melissa. He will. He will. I'll order the tree, madam. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maitland. Uh...
is like when nobody listens to you? As a matter of fact, I do, yeah. Well, I says you all on 10 minutes, John. Thanks. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lay all this on you. Do you have any idea where Melissa or Harley are? As a matter of fact, I was hoping maybe you know. Can you help me out? Melissa and I kept in touch for a while. The last time I talked to her, she was in Hollywood, but I don't know where if she's even still there. Now, what about your brother? Do you have any idea where he might have gone? Probably Canada at first. But he could be anywhere after all this time. Look, if you do find him, would you tell them where I am just in case they might want to get in touch with me? Sure, why not, kid? That's a hell of a big if, my finding them. Hey, you found me. In my book, that makes you one hell of a detective. I happen to be a private investigator. P.I. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck up there. I haven't been in your father's office since he died. Oh, I'm so glad you kept so many of his things. Well, I like having him around. <laughs> Not that I need them to remind me that he was a terrific lawyer and a great father. And a great friend. I miss him, too. Cheers. To life. Uh, sit down, dear. It's a pain in the neck looking up at you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, shall we get started? Amanda, are you sure you want to do this? Well, I'm not committing Harry Carey. I'm just changing my will. I wanted to do it a long time ago, but I just didn't get around to it. All right. The changes you want to make mm -hmm. are going to necessitate you liquidating all of your assets after your death, including your controlling shares in Kingsley International. Uh, yes. So? Andrew expects to inherit that control. Well, so much for great expectations. Now, this is nothing to joke about. This is something that should be given a great deal of thought. Oh, believe me, I have given it a great deal of thought. Amanda, are you going to tell Andrew you're changing your will? Oh, of course. Andrew doesn't like surprises. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Coffee? Do you realize what you'd be doing to Kingsley International? Yes. To me? Yes, but... <laughs> It's not as though you're going to be left destitute. That's not the point! Andy, you already have more money than you'll ever be able to use, plus 49% of the Kingsley stock. Not enough to give me control! And the children, they still have their trust funds, not that they care. And as you already know, the Amos Kingsley Foundation was funded by your father in such a way that makes it perpetually self-sustaining. This isn't what father would have wanted. Andrew, what your father wanted was to protect me during my lifetime. But he also wanted me to be free to dispose of his fortune any way I saw fit at the time of my death. Oh, Andrew. I know that I'm a constant source of irritation to you, that we never see eye to eye on anything. But I was hoping just this once you would understand my need to follow my conscience. What you are doing is insane. Why? If Andrew Carnegie can leave his fortunes to universities and to building libraries, now why can't I leave mine to building shelters for the homeless? Because I won't let you. Uh, You're my lawyers, and I pay you a small fortune to protect my interests. Can't you come up with something? Under the terms of your father's will, Mrs. Kingsley is free to dispose of all he left her when she dies in any manner she sees fit. I know that, but my father never intended to have her create havoc in Kingsley International. Kingsley is far too substantial to be affected. There might be a period of adjustment. It will no longer be controlled by the family. That's always been Kingsley International's greatest asset. I don't need you to tell me that. What I need is your advice on how to stop my mother. There is one way. What?
goodbye to the court and ask them to declare your mother incompetent. Then we can ask the court to name you her conservator. Don't you think that's pretty drastic? Why? Mrs. Kingsley obviously needs to be protected from herself. It's not just a matter of the will. A case can be based on the past eccentric behavior. If you'll remember, I, I did suggest just recently that something ought to be done about Mrs. Kingsley's lack of responsibility in fiscal matters. I'm opposed to such an action. It could be a traumatic experience. Once we petition the court, there will be a hearing. We'll have to bring in psychiatrists to testify to Mrs. Kingsley's diminished capacities. We'll have to provide witnesses to her erratic behavior. It will not only be painful for your mother, but for you as well. There's bound to be publicity, unpleasant publicity. I enjoy doing this to you. You want it? Well, then why do it? I haven't any choice. Oh, that's nonsense. People always have a choice. It's simply a matter of making the right one. You know, if your father were alive, he would beat the living daylights out of you. If father were alive, this wouldn't be necessary. It's not too late to call off the hearing. All you have to do is change your will back to what it was. Oh. Now, don't hold your breath. I'm going to fight you, Andy. I'm going to fight you, and I'm going to win. Investigator from New York. I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes when you finish up here, if that's okay with you. <clears throat> All right? Kingsley's not my name anymore, so I have no idea how you found me. But if you're working for my father, the answer is no. Excuse me, ma'am, I don't know your father. Your grandmother's the one who hired me. That's my favorite picture of my grandmother. Thank you. Well, why don't we go out on the deck? It'll be cooler. Don't scare you living on the edge, I guess not, huh? <laughs> oh. No, only when the earth moves. Which it does from time to time. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty good, you know, finding me the way you did. To tell you the truth, I was about to toss in the towel when it suddenly occurred to me that you might have gotten married, so... Well... That only lasted about a minute and a half. I only got married to spite someone, which isn't very admirable, I guess. But you kept his name. Kingsley's my father's name, and he's the person I was trying to spite by marrying the first and worst man that came along. I'm sure you have your reasons. Look, 
I've been pretty tough on you, haven't I? Ah, come on. In my line of work, you don't expect to win any popularity contests. So, uh, are you going to New York tomorrow? No, no, um, I'm going to Canada. Why Canada? Your kid brother told me that that's probably where Harley went during Vietnam, so... But that was ages ago. That's the only shot I got. Uh, you're really running yourself ragged, aren't you? I didn't think it showed. Actually, I have been thinking of giving myself a day off. And being out here and everything, I thought maybe I'd, you know, taken sights. Well, I, I could be your guide. I, I don't have rehearsals tomorrow, and I'd be glad to show you around. Why? Because I was kind of nasty to you, and I'd like to make it up to you. Do you always look a gift horse in the mouth? I'm no genius, but I've never been accused of being stupid. I thank you for the offer. My father thought it was ridiculous of me to think of becoming an actress. So I enrolled in acting school without telling him. And then I fell in love with one of the students. And when I told my father I was going to get married, I gave my intended husband $50,000 to go away. And he did. Yeah. Sounds like your old man was right about this guy. It's not the point. Oh, I don't understand. What is the point? The point is, my father was trying to teach me that money could buy anything. up here when all the Christmas lights run. Yeah? Mm. What does that mean? That you're not gonna come east for Christmas? I don't know. It's not that I don't want to. I love my grandmother. Look, uh, excuse me. This is probably none of my business, but it really wouldn't have cost you anything to let your grandmother know where you were all these years. But it would have cost her. For as long as I can remember, she had to act as a buffer between our father and us. And I know it really hurt her. And I don't want that to happen again. Look, uh, we better go now. You couldn't really plane tomorrow. I'll stay right here with you until you fall asleep. He's not a crock. Dying just before Christmas. In a dump like this. They don't even let no flowers in here. You're right. It is a crock. I'll be right back. I'd like you to call Dr. Greenspan. Tell him I want a room for Molly at the private pavilion, and then arrange for an ambulance to come and transport her. Very good. All right. She's resting now. Don't worry. I'm afraid I am close on you, Mrs. Kingsley, but there's no one else on whom I could call. It was no imposition, believe me. I'm glad you called. Dr. Weintraub, the girl last four. Dr. Weintraub.
I've never seen so many flowers. <laughs> I'm dying like I was somebody. You silly girl. You are somebody. Oh, you're a child of God, Molly, who loves you dearly. And so do I. Molly. Maria? What are you doing, Maria? They call from the Christmas tree place today, and they say that tomorrow that they're going to bring the tree, so I get ready the bubbles. Good. This one don't look like no bubble. Oh, no. No, no, that goes on top of the tree. My father carved that for me when I was a little girl. I'll tell you all about it someday. He called it the Christmas dove. Oh, I, I, I almost forgot. A uh, Mr. Hoffner called today also. Oh? And? Madam is waiting, Maria. Hold the horses. I listen in Spanish. I got to translate to English. Yeah. Okay. He said to tell you that he found your granddaughter. Oh, that's wonderful. And that he's going to Canada now, and he will call you again when he gets there. <laughs> I just knew that man would succeed. Now there's two down and one to go. Perfect. <laughs> Give me a scotch, will you please? No, wait, wait, wait. Change that to uh, Irish coffee, as long as the coffee is nice and hot. <laughs> Irish coffee, Peter? <laughs> My assumption is that you are not from Canada. Where are you from? Arkansas. Hey, Arkansas. How long have you been up here? Since Vietnam. I'm one mountain boy who ain't able to shoot a rabbit without chucking up, so I wasn't about to shoot people. As a matter of fact, I'm up here looking for somebody who might have come up here during that. Don't you want to go home? There's amnesty now. His uh, grandmother wants him home for Christmas, so I'm looking for him. That's nice. Yeah, folks never want to see me again. Well, I tell you, I've been busting my butt for the last two days, checking with all the official sources they got up here. I don't even know if this guy is in uh, Canada, let alone Toronto. Now, how about Montreal? Lots of the guys went up there. Sure. I could also try Manitoba or Saskatchewan or take a dog sled to the North Pole. I just don't happen to have the time. How about the club? Excuse me, the, the club? That's oh, just what I call it. They helped out guys like me when I first came up here. They got us jobs, tried to find us places to live. Some of the guys needed shrinks and lawyers. They helped out with that, too. I just had no idea they'd have an organization like that anymore. What was the war being over so long? I never thought of it. For some guys, the war won't never be over. Uh, maybe Mays can uh, help you find the guy you're looking for. He's one of the first guys that came here. He helped set up the club. Thank you, Arkansas. You're welcome. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Mays. My name is Morris Huffner. Uh, I'm a private investigator from New York. Do you mind if I talk to you for a second, please? If I had known about your organization, I could have saved myself a hell of a lot of hard work, I'll tell you. Well, we're mostly old news by now, but they still need us. Um, yeah, Harley gives us a hand from time to time, but he's pretty involved in Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, his name's not Kingsley anymore. It's Judd. He took his mother's maiden name when he came to Canada. Excuse me, is that Judd, J-U-D-D? Hmm, yeah. Thank you. Now, do you mind telling me how I can reach him? Like I said, his grandmother's trying to get a message to him. Well, he doesn't have a phone. But I don't think he'd mind me uh, telling you where he lives. He talks a lot about his grandma. He'd like to hear from her. By the way, I really appreciate this. Thank you. It's no problem. Oh, I wouldn't try it tonight, though. You know, he lives pretty far out on a farm. It's no problem. I'll rent a car. No, you don't understand. There's a blizzard coming in. A Canadian blizzard's nothing to be out in. No problem.
good thing my dumb dog took off after a rabbit. I wouldn't have found you until spring thaws. Adam, honey, go get washed up for supper. Well, no. Sweet. You got a nice family. <laughs> well, I wanted a family. I needed one. Excuse me, I know that your mother's dead, but you do still have a father. As far as I'm concerned, my father's dead, too. Carly, I wish you wouldn't say things like that. Why not? It's true. My father has tunnel vision. The only thing he can see at the end of the tunnel is money and power. A lot of time has passed, Harley. Maybe he's changed. I don't believe in miracles. That was a big disappointment to my father. I didn't give a damn about any of the things that were important to him. One of Kingsley's subsidiaries makes helicopters. Had a government contract during the war in Vietnam. I led a demonstration outside the plant and burned my draft card. You led a demonstration against your father's plant? When I told my father I'd rather leave the country than go to Vietnam, he didn't say a word. It just looked straight through me as though I didn't exist anymore. That was the last time I saw him. If I never see him again, it'll be too soon. So I guess this means you're not going home for Christmas, huh? Well, I love my grandmother. Oh, yeah, everybody loves Grandma. Well, what does that mean? It means that I don't buy it. I heard exactly the same thing from your brother and from your sister. If you really love your Grandma so much, she shouldn't have had to hire me to come looking for you, no matter how rotten your relationship was with your father, for crying out loud. She's an old lady. She's your grandma. The next time you see her might be at her funeral. I understood your question, sir. English is my native language. Well, kindly answer it. Don't you think it was foolish for Mrs. Kingsley to go to Skid Row with thousands of dollars in a satchel? I thought it was a sensible thing to do since neither Mrs. Kingsley nor I have sufficient room in our pockets to accommodate such an amount of cash. <laughs> you know what I mean, Mr. Maitland. Most people would think it bizarre to uh, carry around a fortune in a satchel. What would have been bizarre is if it had been in a trunk. <laughs> We're not here to entertain the public, Mr. Maitland. You were present when Mrs. Kinsley assaulted the police officer and broke his nose? Correction, sir. It was I who broke the officer's nose, and it was he who did the assaulting. Quiet, please. We'll move on to other matters. Isn't it a fact that Mrs. Kingsley bought $6,000 worth of toys from an exclusive toy store just a short time ago? Yes. Well, don't you think that's a rather exorbitant amount of money to spend on toys? Not if the toys were for children's hospitals and juvenile facilities. And to anticipate your next question, Mrs. Kingsley spends a similar amount of money on toys every Christmas and has done so for the past 20 years or so. Thank you. That was my next question. I have here a receipted hospital bill which Mrs. Kingsley paid. It was for a bag lady. I find that term offensive, sir. Her name was Molly Gottchalk, and she was a homeless, destitute woman who was dying. Mrs. Kingsley had her transferred from Bellevue to a private hospital. The room bill and the doctor's bill comes to $5,400. Is that correct? It is. Destitute people can die without charge at Bellevue. You may find that comforting, sir. I don't. Most people aren't so cavalier with their money. I also have a florist bill, which Mrs. Kingsley paid. 
$800 for flowers delivered to the private room in the private hospital. And that doesn't include the flowers for the funeral. And then there's the cost of the burial plot and the interment. Yes, I was getting to that. Don't you think that's a lot of money to pay for a stranger? If you are suggesting that Mrs. Kingsley's acts of charity are irrational, let me suggest that you find Corinthians 1 equally so. To quote, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Mr. Jameson asked you a couple of questions, and I'm going to do the same. It's called cross-examination. You don't have to explain. I saw it all on TV. Cross-examination is when you try to trick me, huh? <laughs> all I want from you is the truth. Mrs. Kingsley has numerous cats. Can you tell me how many? Well, who counts? You don't like cats, huh? Some cats I like better than people. Well, don't you find it strange that she has so many cats in an apartment? It's a big apartment. In Puerto Rico, the house where I live is not so big as one room in this apartment. Really? Well, your family must be able to afford a much larger house. Mrs. Kinsley gives you money to send to them, doesn't she? Every month. <laughs> and she say that when they are ready, she's going to bring them all here from Puerto Rico. <laughs> That's very generous of her. How many in your family? Uh, nine. Uh. But I'm counting one aunt, and she's only a maybe. Mrs. Kinsley's going to pay for all their plane fares? Well, how else they get here? Only God can walk on water. Uh -huh. Very true. Thank you, Miss Estevez. You've been very helpful. I understand your field was philosophy also towards English literature. I'm impressed. It's hard for me to understand how someone with such obvious gifts could end up on the street. I was terminated when the budget for my department was cut. I, I soon exhausted all my savings. I'm very sorry. Budget cuts. Are they the only reasons that the university let you go? They fired you because you're an alcoholic, didn't they? An alcoholic, a falling down drunk, who preferred to present himself to Mrs. Kingsley in a much more sympathetic light. He took advantage of a rich and vulnerable old lady. That is enough. You have absolutely no right to speak to this man in that manner. What kind of a human being are you? <laughs> Jameson, I will see you and your client in chambers. Fine. That goes for you, too, Mr. Groden. I understand that you are overwrought, Mrs. Kingsley. I am not overwrought. I am outraged. However, that's not the reason we're asking for this delay, Your Honor. We see no reason for a delay, Your Honor. We feel we've made our case and a decision is forthcoming. May I ask why you want a delay? I will tell him, Stuart. My grandchildren are coming home for Christmas. I would like you to meet with them and to talk with them. And if you decide that I need a conservator, I want you to appoint them as my conservators. That's ridiculous. I have no objection to a delay. Well, if the 
Mr. Kingsley has no objection. I see no reason not to grant brief delay. Thank you. Shall we say January the 5th at 10 a.m.? And I think it would be advisable for us to meet here in my chambers. Thank you. Thank you. A happy Christmas, Your Honor. A happy Christmas to you, Mrs. Kingsley. Is there something else, Mr. Kingsley? I didn't want to say this in front of my mother. I was afraid it would embarrass and humiliate her. That's why I agreed to the delay. I don't follow you. My children, the uh, grandchildren my mother referred to, are not coming home. Not for Christmas, probably never. They've been gone for a great deal of time, and their whereabouts are unknown. I started this action because I felt that my mother was no longer able to handle her own affairs. But I didn't realize how much she had deteriorated. She's fantasizing now, suffering from delusions. <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Hopner, for coming here. I know it would have been much easier for you if you had just mailed in your report. Well, that's, that's okay. Oh. I just feel so sorry that I couldn't tell you that they were coming home, that's all. Oh, but they'll be home for Christmas. Uh, excuse me. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. Yes, you did. It's just that I know my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, uh, if you're free on Christmas Eve, we have open house here, and I'd like very much to have you come. Oh, thank you. Oh. I don't have a family, so I never have anything special to do on Christmas. Oh. Th this is awfully nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> then it's all settled. Thanks. And goodbye again. Uh, Mr. Hoffner, I think you're a wonderful detective. Oh. Private investigator. Whatever. You're wonderful. Oh, the lights look wonderful. Mm. See how white the dove is now? Yeah. It does look different. What do you do to it? Oh, I put it in the dishwashing machine. <laughs> you did. <laughs> the children are going to get a bang out of that. <laughs> Maitland. I thought the detectives say the grandkids wasn't coming home. Mrs. Kingsley believes they'll come, but I'm very much afraid she's going to be disappointed. Today, instead of reading you a fairy story, as I usually do, I'm going to tell you a really true Christmas story. Would you like that? Yeah. Does it have a happy ending? Well, it starts out rather sadly, but yes, it does have a happy ending. Good. Once upon a time. <laughs> a long, long time ago, when I was a little girl, just like you, I lived on a farm with my mother and father. And each year, just before Christmas, my father would take me into town to buy a gift for my mother. Then, one year, when I was seven years old, a sad thing happened. And there wasn't any reason to go into town to buy the gift. My mother died. But I didn't cry. I was too angry to cry because she had gone away and left me. My father told me it would be better if I cried. Because, he said, tears were God's way of melting a heart that was frozen in grief. But I was too angry to cry. And that was when he told me the story of the Christmas dove. Some people call it the dove of peace. Anyway, he said it happened during a terrible, terrible war. And that one evening, even though it was Christmas Eve, there was a battle raging. And suddenly, across the battlefield, a beautiful dove appeared, soaring gracefully and easily. And when the soldiers saw it, their guns went silent, and they remembered that it was the birthday of the Prince of Peace. And then what do you think happened? 
Well, those soldiers threw away their guns when they started walking toward each other across the battlefield. And when they reached each other, they embraced and they wept. And their tears melted the anger in their hearts. And then I cried too, because I understood why my father had told me the story of the Christmas dove. I realized that he wanted me to know that there's no peace without forgiveness and no happiness without peace. Nathan, will you be good enough to ask my mother if she'll see me? Madam's resting. Please ask her, it's important. If you'd care to wait in the living room, I'll inquire. Andrew. Are you all right, Mother? I'm fine. I was wondering if perhaps you wouldn't like to fly down to Bermuda with me for the holidays. I am not about to have the children arrive and find an empty apartment. No. I don't want you to sit here and wait for something that's not going to happen. Are you sure we should be having this conversation at all? After all, we are adversaries, you know. We're not adversaries. Oh. I'm sorry I had to put you through that court hearing, but I had no choice. So you said. Well, I had to protect what Father spent his lifetime building up. I don't have to tell you how much I admired Father. So you said many times. Well, it's true. Yes, well, I think that your father would have preferred to have you love him. Well, of course I... I did. Even the word makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> it's such a simple word. Why is it so hard for you? You know I'm not demonstrative. I know, but people need to know. They need to be told that they're loved. Did you ever tell your children that you love them? Did you ever tell Marion? She was your wife. And the only thing she wanted when she was dying was to hear you say you loved her. You weren't even with her when she died. Well, you know I had to be in London. There was a great deal of money involved. Oh. And I had a responsibility to the shareholders. I inherited that responsibility. I had to prove that I was as capable as father, didn't I? Why? Did you think I would love you any less because you weren't? Oh, Andrew. Love, real love, it's unconditional. Then why did I feel I had to earn it? Why did I always feel that I wasn't included in what you had with Father? But you were. I was not. I wasn't going to let that happen again, and I didn't. Oh, God. It isn't possible. Excuse me, madam. Would you like your dinner in front of the fire tonight? Is something wrong? Be because Amos and I were so much in love, and we never hesitated to show it, Andrew grew up believing that he wasn't a part of it, that he was excluded. Oh, oh, that poor little boy. Oh, how lonely he must have been. And how insensitive of me not to have seen what was happening. Minton, 
I've been so blind for so many years. I just, I just pray to God that my son can forgive me. You've done nothing that requires forgiveness. Oh, but I have. If Andrew can't show love or even express it, then it's, it's got to be more my fault than it is his. I'm so sorry. Seven o'clock. When will the company come? People come whenever they please when it's open house, Maria. Bring in the eggnog. Well, it all looks beautiful. You've outdone yourself. Thank you, madam. Uh, you didn't forget the pine cones, did you? No. The cones are in the basket by the fireplace. Good. I want it to smell as beautiful as it looks. Uh, were you able to get a hold of Andrew? Andrew hasn't been in his office all day, madam. But I left word with his secretary that you wanted to see him this evening. Well, um, perhaps... Perhaps you'd better put a note under his door. I've already done that, madam. Oh, you're aware of me. Company! Pinecone. Maria, bring in more eggnog cups. I'll see to the door. Leave the door open, Maitland. There should always be an open door on Christmas Eve. Yes, madam. Oh, Mr. Maitland, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Huffner. Oh, thank you. Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> oh, how nice of you. Oh, my, that's lovely. <laughs> my Come pleasure. in. Thank you. Maria. See, si, madame. Oh, put this on ice, will you? And we'll have it with supper. See, si, okay. Oh, well. my. I, uh, I was brought up in a home. You were? Yeah. They call them orphanages now. Oh, yes. I used to sit around and try to imagine what a real Christmas would be like. This is it. <laughs> That's a lovely thing to say. Come in. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, would you like an eggnog? Um. Uh, or maybe a drink. Mate, let me pick you a drink if you prefer. It's Christmas. Eggnog. Eggnog, certainly. <laughs> I see you're expecting a lot of company. Oh. Mr. Jameson, he's my attorney. He usually makes this the last call of the evening. And then there are the people from the Sullivan House, but they won't come until after their own party. And, of course, my son and my grandchildren. Mrs. Kingsley, about your grandchildren. <laughs> I don't know what time they'll get here, but they will get here. Please. Thank you. <sighs> Would you like an hors d'oeuvre? Not at the moment, thanks. Oh. Have you been keeping yourself busy? Yes. I closed my office. You mean for the holidays? Uh-uh, for good. Oh, but why? You're such a good detective. Uh, investigator. Thank you for remembering. 
No, I'm not going to give that up. I just think it's about time I got out of Brooklyn. Oh. And where will you go? I've been thinking about moving to Los Angeles. I like the climate. You do. See this? Mm -hmm. Josh made it for me. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the piece of music that's inside of it, too. That's nice. On his 16th birthday. It was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> music. Maria. Si, madam. Would you please put on some Christmas carols? Anything. Yes, madam. Are you starving? No. Oh, thank heaven, because we're not going to sit down until all of the guests arrive. All right? <laughs> now, this is Harley's. You made it in. It's quite late, madam. Would you like me to serve dinner? Oh, no, Mason. We'll wait for the children. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Mr. Hefner, would you push that log before it falls? Thank you. Yeah. Disappointed, Mrs. Kingsley. Josh. But Liz had called me already. Yes. I didn't even know how to reach Josh until Morris. <laughs> Mr. Huffner left his number with me. And oh. with me. Oh, he <laughs> did. Uh, oh, wait, did. I almost forgot. Uh huh. Grandma. This is Patty. We're getting married. Oh, well, that is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another surprise for you, Grandma. This is Nora. Nora. God bless you, dear. And this is our little boy, Adam. Oh, Adam, well, you are my best Christmas present. Let me see you. Oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> Give Grandma a big kiss. Mm, thank you. Grandma. Yes, honey. What? Well, it's taken us a long time to grow up yeah. and realize that Usually there's a reason why people act the way they do. Yes, there is. <laughs> and maybe we didn't try to understand Father any more than he tried to understand us. Oh, sweetheart. <laughs> so if he'll give us another chance, we'd like to try, too. Oh. I just can't tell you how happy you've made me. All of you. I'm so... I'm so thrilled to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Josh. <laughs> 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 Please, come in. No, thank you. I just dropped by the to give you this. Uh, what is it? The documents avoiding my request to be your conservator. No one needs a conservator less than you. Thank you. Oh. I know I have 
haven't always understood you, Andrew. But there never was a moment that I didn't love you. I want you to know that. And I want you to believe that. It's very important for both of us. Mommy says you're supposed to be my grandfather. This is Adam, Harley's little boy. His son. I'm not supposed to be your grandfather, Adam. I am your grandfather. Welcome home. Are you all right, Adam? Come in, quickly. Look. Look, they're on the terrace. Oh. Oh, perfect. Merry Christmas, Madeline. Oh, Merry Christmas to you too, Maitland. <laughs> 